Chapter 7 The Case of the Hidden Germans Lewis gasped for a moment, silent in contemplation of the magnificence of rumor. The Germans already landed, hiding underground, striking by night, secretly, terribly, at the power of England. Here was a conception which made the myth of the Russians a paltry fable, before which the legend of Mons was an ineffectual thing. It was monstrous, and yet... He looked steadily at Merritt, a square-headed, black-haired, solid sort of man. He had symptoms of nerves about him for the moment, certainly, but one could not wonder at that, whether the tales he told were true, or whether he merely believed them to be true. Lewis had known his brother-in-law for twenty years or more, and had always found him a sure man in his own small world. But then, said the doctor to himself, those men, if they once get out of the ring of that little world of theirs, they are lost. Those are the men that believed in Madame Blavatsky. Well, he said, what do you think yourself? The Germans landed in hiding somewhere about the country. There's something extravagant in the notion, isn't there? I don't know what to think. You can't get over the facts. There are the soldiers with their rifles and their guns at the works all over Stratfordshire, and those guns go off. I told you I'd heard them. Then who are the soldiers shooting at? That's what we ask ourselves at Midlingham. Quite so. I quite understand. It's an extraordinary state of things. It's more than extraordinary. It's an awful state of things. It's terror in the dark, and there's nothing worse than that. As that young fellow I was telling you about said, At the front, you do know what you're up against. And people really believe that a number of Germans have somehow got over to England and have hid themselves underground. People say they've got a new kind of poison gas. Some think that they dug underground places and make the gas there and lead it by secret pipes into the shops. Others say that they throw gas bombs into the factories. It must be worse than anything they've used in France, from what the authorities say. The authorities, do they admit that there are Germans in hiding about Middlingham? No, they call it explosions. But we know it isn't explosions. We know in the Midlands what an explosion sounds like and looks like. And we know that the people killed in these explosions are put into their coffins in the works. Their own relations are not allowed to see them. And so you believe in the German theory? If I do, it's because one must believe in something. Some say they've seen the gas. I heard that a man living in Dunwich saw it one night like a black cloud with sparks of fire in it floating over the tops of the trees by Dunwich Common. The light of an ineffable amazement came into Lewis's eyes. The night of Remnant's visit, the trembling vibration of the air, the dark tree that had grown in his garden since the setting of the sun, the strange leafage that was starred with burning, with emerald and ruby fires, and all vanished away when he returned from his visit to the garth. And such a leafage had appeared as a burning cloud far in the heart of England. What intolerable mystery, what tremendous doom was signified in this! But one thing was clear and certain, that the terror of Marion, was also the terror of the Midlands. Lewis made up his mind most firmly that, if possible, all this should be kept from his brother-in-law. Merritt had come to Porth as to a city of refuge from the horrors of Midlingham. If it could be managed, he should be spared the knowledge that the cloud of terror had gone before him and hung black over the western land. Lewis passed the port and said in an even voice, very strange indeed, a black cloud with sparks of fire. I can't answer for it, you know, it's only a rumor. Just so, and you think, or you're inclined to think, that this and all the rest you've told me is to be put down to the hidden Germans. As I say, because one must think something. I quite see your point. No doubt, if it's true, it's the most awful blow that has ever been dealt to any nation in the whole history of man. The enemy established in our vitals. 
But is it possible after all? How could it have been worked? Merritt told Lewis how it had been worked, or rather, how people said it had been worked. The idea, he said, was that this was a part, and a most important part, of the German plot to destroy England and the British Empire. The scheme had been prepared years ago, some thought soon after the Franco-Prussian War. Moltke had seen that the invasion of England, in the ordinary sense of the term invasion, presented very great difficulties. The matter was constantly in discussion in the inner military and high political circles, and the general trend of opinion in these quarters was that at the best, the invasion of England would involve Germany in the gravest difficulties, and leave France in the position of the Tertius Gaudens. This was the state of affairs when a very high Prussian personage was approached by the Swedish professor, Huvelius. Thus merit, and here I would say in parentheses that this Huvelius was by all accounts an extraordinary man. Considered personally and apart from his writings, he would appear to have been a most amiable individual. He was richer than the generality of Swedes, certainly far richer than the average university professor in Sweden, but his shabby green frock coat and his battered furry hat were notorious in the university town where he lived. No one laughed, because it was well known that Professor Huvelius spent every penny of his private means, and a large portion of his official stipend, on works of kindness and charity. He hid his head in a garret, someone said, in order that others might be able to swell on the first floor. It was told of him that he restricted himself to a diet of dry bread and coffee for a month, in order that a poor woman in the streets, dying of consumption, might enjoy luxuries in hospital. And this was the man who wrote the treatise De Facinore Humano, to prove the infinite corruption of the human race. Oddly enough, Professor Huvelius wrote the most cynical book in the world. Hobbes preaches rosy sentimentalism in comparison, with the very highest motives. He held that a very large part of human misery, misadventure, and sorrow was due to the false convention that the heart of man was naturally and in the main well disposed and kindly, if not exactly righteous. Murderers, thieves, assassins, violators, and all the host of the abominable, he says in one of his passages, are created by the false pretense and foolish credence of human virtue. A lion in a cage is a fierce beast indeed, but what will he be if we declare him to be a lamb and open the doors of his den? Who will be guilty of the deaths of the men, women, and children whom he will surely devour, save those who unlocked the cage? And he goes on to show that kings and the rulers of the peoples could decrease the sum of human misery to a vast extent by acting on the doctrine of human wickedness. War, he declares, which is one of the worst of evils, will always continue to exist. But a wise king will desire a brief war rather than a lengthy one, a short evil rather than a long evil, and this not from the benignity of his heart towards his enemies, for we have seen that the human heart is naturally malignant, but because he desires to conquer, and to conquer easily, without a great expenditure of men or of treasure, knowing that if he can accomplish this feat, his people will love him, and his crown will be secure. So he will wage brief victorious wars, and not only spare his own nation, but the nation of his enemy, since in a short war the loss is less on both sides than in a long war, and so from evil will come good. And how, asks Huvelius, are such wars to be waged? The wise prince, he replies, will begin by assuming the enemy to be infinitely corruptible and infinitely stupid, since stupidity and corruption are the chief characteristics of man. So the prince will make himself friends in the very councils of his enemy, and also amongst the populace, bribing the wealthy by proffering to them the opportunity of still greater wealth, and winning the poor by swelling words. For, contrary to the common opinion, it is the wealthy who are greedy of wealth, 
while the populace are to be gained by talking to them about liberty, their unknown god. And so much are they enchanted by the words of liberty, freedom, and such like, that the wise can go to the poor, rob them of what little they have, dismiss them with a hearty kick, and win their hearts and their votes forever, if only they will assure them that the treatment which they have received is called liberty. Guided by these principles, says Huvelius, the wise prince will entrench himself in the country that he desires to conquer. Nay, with but little trouble, he may actually and literally throw his garrisons into the heart of the enemy country before war has begun. This is a long and tiresome parenthesis, but it is necessary as explaining the long tale which Merritt told his brother-in-law he having received it from some magnate of the Midlands, who had travelled in Germany. It is probable that the story was suggested in the first place by the passage from Huvelius, which I have just quoted. Merritt knew nothing of the real Huvelius, who was all but a saint. He thought of the Swedish professor as a monster of iniquity, worse, as he said, than Nietzsche, meaning, no doubt, Nietzsche. So he told the story of how Huvelius had sold his plan to the Germans, a plan for filling England with German soldiers. Land was to be bought in certain suitable and well-considered places. Englishmen were to be bought as the apparent owners of such land, and secret excavations were to be made till the country was literally undermined. A subterranean Germany, in fact, was to be dug under selected districts of England. There were to be great caverns, underground cities, well-drained, well-ventilated, supplied with water, and in these places vast stores both of food and of munitions were to be accumulated year after year till the day dawned. And then, warned in time, the secret garrison would leave shops, hotels, offices, villas, and vanish underground, ready to begin their work of bleeding England at the heart. That's what Henson told me, said Merritt at the end of his long story. Henson, head of the Buckley Iron and Steel Syndicate. He has been a lot in Germany. Well, said Lewis, of course it may be so. If it is so, it is terrible beyond words. Indeed, he found something horribly plausible in the story. It was an extraordinary plan, of course, an unheard-of scheme, but it did not seem impossible. It was the Trojan horse on a gigantic scale. Indeed, he reflected, the story of the horse with the warriors concealed within it, which was dragged into the heart of Troy by the deluded Trojans themselves, might be taken as a prophetic parable of what had happened to England, if Henson's theory were well founded. And this theory certainly squared with what one had heard of German preparations in Belgium and in France and placements for guns ready for the invader, German manufactories, which were really German forts on Belgian soil, the caverns by the Ain made ready for the cannon. Indeed, Lewis thought he remembered something about suspicious concrete tennis courts on the heights commanding London, but a German army hidden under English ground. It was a thought to chill the stoutest heart. And it seemed from that wonder of the burning tree, that the enemy mysteriously and terribly present at Middlingham was also present in Marion. Lewis, thinking of the country as he knew it, of its wild and desolate hillsides, its deep woods, its wastes and solitary places, could not but confess that no more fit region could be found for the deadly enterprise of secret men. Yet, he thought again, there was but little harm to be done in Marion to the armies of England or to their munitionment. They were working for panic terror. Possibly that might be so, but the camp under the highway, that should be the first object, and no harm had been done there. Lewis did not know that since the panic of the horses, men had died terribly in that camp, that it was now a fortified place, with a deep, broad trench, and thick tangles of savage barbed wire about it, and a machine gun planted at each corner. 